Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Once again, it's good to see everybody in program number four, right? And uh, then we'll be out of here. For those of you joining us on television, that's just what we are. We're a group that come together. Uh, if you're ever in Tulsa or you know, headed this way on the first Wednesday of the month, isn't it, honey, usually? And, uh, but check with us. Call us on our 800. Make sure that we're going to be taping. And uh, we'd love to have you stop by and spend the afternoon with us. Again, we always like to emphasize that we're not associated with any group. I'm not going to trumpet any one particular line. I'm not going to attack anybody, hopefully. All we want to do is just open the book and uh, let people begin to study on their own. And I think the Lord is, is doing that in a lot of hearts, is showing them how to read and enjoy and study the book on their own. Again, we always like to thank you for your letters, your phone calls of encouragement. And uh, I guess I really should uh, make mention of the fact that if you would like to get our quarterly newsletter and you're not, give us a phone call and give us your name and address. On the other hand, if you're getting our newsletter and you no longer want to get it, goodness sakes, call and tell us so that we get your name off the mailing list and save the postage. So uh, I've noticed a lot of other newsletters are doing that, uh, that we get. They say, if you don't care to get it, why... Uh, please let us know because postage is getting prohibitive. So again, uh, let us know either way. Okay, let's pick right up where we left off and uh, we are now in 1 Peter chapter 5. And again, for review, over and over and over, these little epistles are written to Jewish believers who had been scattered out of the area of Jerusalem and Judea, probably by Saul's persecution. And uh, they have established little congregations around that part of the Eastern Mediterranean. But I think that these little letters are primarily written to congregations in the western end of Turkey. Now, the book of James, on the other hand, I felt, and I think I made that plain at the time, was probably written to one larger congregation, not necessarily Jerusalem, but maybe Alexandria or maybe one of the areas up in northern Galilee. But these little epistles, I would think, are addressed to the several churches in uh, the area of Asia Minor, or what we call the land of Turkey. Now, it came up at break time while I was having my cup of coffee. We don't want to leave the impression that Peter is associating the salvation of these Jews being accomplished by their martyrdom. I hope that didn't come across, because... We are all aware now that that's the idea behind the Muslim suicide bombers, is that if they can become a martyr, they're going to immediately go to paradise. Well, that is not at all what we teach, that when you go through martyrdom, you are guaranteed uh, an eternal life. But for the believer, for the true saved individual that is martyred, yes, he's going to be instantly in the Lord's presence, just like anyone who dies a natural death. So the martyr's death does not in itself guarantee salvation. All right, now then, as we come into chapter 5, this is pretty much along the same line that Paul teaches for establishing his Gentile churches. And uh, no doubt a lot of this was patterned after the synagogues of Israel. And uh, it just falls in line that the Jewish believers are under the same God that we Gentile believers are. Never forget that. We got the same God who is dealing with both sides, the Jew and the Gentile. And then, of course, when we get to Paul, there is a breakdown of the distinction between Jew and Gentile. The middle wall of partition has been broken down. And now in this age of grace, there is no difference between black or white, rich or poor, Jew or Gentile. We are all one in the body of Christ. And Iris and I experience it all the time. We can go into a home that's as modest, almost poor as can be, and the spiritual camaraderie is just as good as on up the scale. We've gone into black families' homes, and we just have thoroughly enjoyed that because we're all members of the body of Christ, and there is no distinction. All right, so now then, coming down into chapter 5, dealing with these Jewish congregations, you have the same kind of language. 
where Peter says in verse 1, The elders who are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, speaking of himself. Now, I've pointed this out in other times, but we certainly know that at Pentecost, and even during Christ's earthly ministry, Peter was the head man. Peter spoke for the twelve invariably, and at Pentecost, everybody recognized Peter as the head of the Jerusalem church. But now come back with me to Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, <clears throat> where some of you have heard me teach it, I don't know how many times, I never get tired of it, but for those of you out on television, it may be something relatively new, but in Galatians chapter 2, and I want you to bring, bring you down to verse 9. Now this, of course, is the Jerusalem Council. After several years of Paul's ministry, uh, false teachers emanating from the Jerusalem church were coming in behind Paul, of course, and telling Paul's Gentile converts that they didn't have to, uh, or they had to keep the law and circumcision in order to be saved. And, of course, Paul and Barnabas meet with Peter, James, and John up there in Jerusalem to refute that. But the point I want to make here is that Peter has now lost that place of top man authority. It is now James. See? All right, in Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 9, when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars. In other words, they had lost a lot of their authority because Israel is rejecting everything and they are sliding to the dispersion of 70 AD. But just like Peter shows in his epistles back here, they're not aware of that yet. They, they think everything is still A-OK. -okay. They still think Israel is still going to go in through and through the tribulation and have their king and their kingdom. But here it's obvious now that James, who was not even the James of the Twelve, he's been beheaded, but this James is now the uh, moderator of this meeting. And so it was James and Peter and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived or understood the grace that was given to me, so they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we would go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. All right, now the companion passage, of course, is Acts 15, and let's go back there, where it's more obvious that James is the moderator. It's Acts 15. Drop down to verse 13. We were here, I think, in one of the previous programs for a different reason, but on the other hand, it's to show now that Peter is no longer the head honcho of the Jewish equation. James is. All right, Acts 15, verse 13. <clears throat> and after they had held their peace, James, the moderator, answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. For Simeon, Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, and so on and so forth. And then you come down to verse 19, James continues, Wherefore my sentence is. He's the one who is making the authoritative statement, not Peter. And that should be sufficient. Now, same way with the lineup of these epistles. And I think the Holy Spirit did it purposely, that James is first, not Peter. It's James' epistle. And then we go to 1 Peter and 2 Peter and then John. Okay, but whatever. Here we are now in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to have the organization laid out much as it was in the Jewish synagogue, but also in Paul's uh, instructions to the Gentile churches in 1 Timothy chapter 3. All right, verse 1 again, The elders who are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. He doesn't claim to be the head man. He's just merely one of the elders. And a witness to the sufferings of Christ. In other words, Peter was there at the crucifixion. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, what in the world do you suppose he was talking about? Well, I think he was talking about the transfiguration. 
Do you remember what happened at the transfiguration? Let's go back and look at it. Back in Matthew. Now, well, let's see. I'm in the wrong place. Huh? 17? Yeah, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Actually, 16, and then into 17. Matthew 16. Verse 28. Where Jesus is speaking now to the twelve. And he says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here. Not all of them. Only three. But there be some standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Quite a statement, wasn't it? Now chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days, six days later, Jesus takes Peter. Now there he's in first place again. Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. Now here was the glory that Peter, I think, is referring to in his little epistle. And his face, that is, the face of Jesus, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now that's glorious in my book. It was almost blinding. Okay, so that's the glory that I think Peter can make reference to, that he and James and John had witnessed it. And of course, it was just a little preview of the glory that he will reveal when he comes and sets up his kingdom, when again he will be that light of the world. All right, back to 1 Peter chapter 5. So he was a witness, verse 1, of the sufferings and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. In other words, when Christ returns, that glory of the transfiguration will be fulfilled to its completeness. Now then, in the interim, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. In other words, what's Peter saying? You don't enter into the Lord's service with the idea of monetary return. That's not our reason for serving. Naturally, every servant has to have enough to feed himself and his family and so forth, but it is not the prerequisite for service. All right, so feed the flock of God, be, be a shepherd, and again, I think in, uh, in the synagogue there was the upper shepherds and the lower shepherds. All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Now verse 4, and when the chief shepherd, capitalized, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, I think this might be as good a time as any. It might be a later verse, but I think this is a good time. Come back with me to John's Gospel. When we speak of sheep and the shepherd and the flock, what people are we generally speaking of? Israel. Israel. Israel are always referred to as sheep. Christ is always referred to as the shepherd, and he uses the parables of the shepherd. And uh, I cannot find anything that pertains to Gentiles being called God's sheep. All right, but here in John's Gospel, chapter 21, and you all know the account, back here in John's Gospel, chapter 21, in his resurrected body now, he appears to the eleven up there at Galilee, and after the miracle of the net full of fish that did not break. Now come down to verse 15. After they had eaten that delicious bread and fish. You know, I referred to it several programs back. 
That must have been the most delicious meal ever served up to mortal man. And as if you like fish like Iris and I do. My, that's one thing we enjoy about our seminars in Florida. We eat fish till it comes out our ears. And we love it. But I'll bet this was super. Don't you know that the Lord knows how to do everything better than any mortal? But he has fish ready for him to eat, and he says, When they had dined, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? Now, some people think he's talking about his fellow disciples. I don't. I think he's talking about fish. Don't you? Yeah, because that was his business. He was a fisherman. He loved fish like I love cattle. Now, that's all there's to it. Let's be honest about it. But now he's put on the spot. Peter, do you love me more than your fishing business up in Galilee? Are you ready to turn your back on all that and be my servant? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now look what Jesus' answer was. Feed my, what? Lambs. Now what are lambs? Well, they're sheep. So who are the sheep in Scripture? Israel. So who was Peter to be feeding? Jews. And who does Peter feed? Jews. And always remember that. He's obedient to what the Lord said. Well, let's just keep going while we're here. And he said the second sign. Verse 16, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And again the Lord said, What? Feed my sheep. And then down to verse 17 at the end, Jesus said for the third time, Feed my sheep. Now what do you suppose those three commands set opposite? His three denials. Three times when Peter said, I don't know that man, three times the Lord says, feed my sheep. Okay, now this is exactly what he's referring to now in his little epistle then, that it's his responsibility as the well of the rest of the Jewish leadership to feed God's sheep. And that's Israel, the Jewish element. All right, uh, verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Now, what is always the first thing you think of when you hear the word flock? Well, sheep, a flock of sheep, see? Now, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd, see how all the language fits? Now, Israel's chief shepherd, their Messiah, their king, their redeemer, their savior, but also their chief shepherd. And all those promises, the Old Testament, are going to finally be fulfilled. And he will be the shepherd of the sheep in his pasture. All right? Verse 4, reading on, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you, those believing Jews, faithful to martyrdom even, shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. This is all just good common sense instruction now, and from which we can also draw. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Now verse 6, humble yourselves. In other words, humility is something that we have to generate ourselves. Humility is not a gift, something that we have to precipitate. So we humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And if we remain humble, then God will exalt us in due time. Now verse 7, casting all your care upon him. Now he's drawing from the Old Testament promises. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. In fact, let's go look at it. That would be in Psalms. Oh, let's see. Psalms 55. Let's go back and check that one. Psalms 55. Verse 22. Psalms 55, verse 22. And this work, the Holy Spirit is causing Peter to draw. 
And of course, David knew what it was to rely totally upon his God. Psalms 55, verse 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Casting all your care upon him. All right, back to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5 again. Verse 8. If you're going to cast your care upon the Lord Jesus, then it behooves us to live accordingly. And we're to be sober. We're to be vigilant. In other words, we got to be on top of it constantly. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But as I was thinking this over last night, I got to think, how does Paul depict Satan? 2 Corinthians, is it chapter 3? I hope it is. No, 2 Corinthians uh, 11. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11. Drop down verse 13. Now remember what Peter just said. Beware of Satan, who is as a roaring lion, seeking him we may devour. Paul depicts him Verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed not into a lion, but a what? An angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. And their end, of course, will be according to their work. Now, as I was thinking of this, which form, if you had a choice, which form would you rather be confronted with? The lion or the angel of light? I'll take the lion. I'll take the lion because you know you're in trouble with him. But with that angel of light, you've got to be wise as a serpent to see the difference because it's so subtle. And you know, we're finding it out more and more that all the false teaching that's coming in off the internet and off television, my goodness, it may be 80, 90% truth. I just read an article the other night by one of the old uh, Bible scholars of a bygone day, and he used the analogy of steak laced with um, arsenic. Steak laced with arsenic. How does it taste? delicious. But the more you eat of it, the quicker you're going to die. Well, you see, that's exactly what Satan is doing today. He's lacing gorgeous steaks with arsenic, and people are falling for it, left and right. I think I mentioned in our last taping, I had a fellow call, and he was following this kind of stuff, and I said, man, you're being pied pipered. He didn't know what I was talking about. Evidently, he had never been to grade school. But you all know the story of the Pied Piper. He piped, and the rats followed to their doom. Well, that's what's happening today. These false teachers are up there. They're piping the tune, and the multitudes are following them. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> Why? Because up there in verse 13, this is the reason. For such are false apostles. That's what some of them claim to be, you know, that they're apostles. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're false teachers. And we're going to be looking at that more in the next taping when we get to 2 Peter chapter 3, which is almost word for word with the little book of Jude. And it just lays out the descriptive language of these false teachers. <clears throat> but, then again, verse 14, 
don't be, don't be surprised. No marvel. Because that's what Satan does all the time. He transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing, verse 15, if his ministers also are transformed. So that's what we're up against. Peter's followers back here in the little epistle are up against a lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, of course, we can use both analogies, and uh, hopefully I've made my point. The lion aspect is relatively easy to recognize. You know you're in trouble when a lion confronts you, but when an angelic light appears, people fall for it. They just fall for it because, oh my goodness, if it's a light, it must be God. No, it's a false angel of light. All right, time's going by. We've got to finish the chapter, if at all possible. All right, so now then, verse 9, back in 1 Peter 5. Wherefore, or whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accompanied your brethren that are in the world. In other words, we all are confronted with these same things. But the God of all grace, who has called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him that is to Christ be glory and dominion forever. Now he's winding down the letter and he says by Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. Now remember, grace did not start with Paul. Paul becomes, of course, the more eminent apostle of grace. But God has always dealt in grace. When he saved Adam and Eve, it was in grace. When he helped Noah escape the flood, it was grace. When he brought out Israel out of Egypt, it was grace. So that's nothing new. The only thing is that it is so much more epitomized when we get to Paul that God can pour out his grace on ungodly, unregenerate Gentiles. And that was hard to comprehend. All right, verse 13. <clears throat> the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son, greet you one another and so on and so forth. Now, I think the Babylon here is Jerusalem and not Iraq. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.